Hi, Gerald. How are you doing? I'm well, Itu Meleng. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to say, firstly, thank you for, for taking time out to have this conversation with me um, and, and also for volunteering to have the conversation with me. I really appreciate that. No, it's an honor. Actually, when I saw what you're doing about mentoring uh, students, these are the upcoming leaders for us in business or in public uh, fertility. So really, why not to share one thought or two? Who knows whom it could benefit? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I really appreciate that uh, very much because it, it's been helping a lot of people. I've been getting nice feedback from people saying, continue with the conversations. It's even helping us who are working uh, and looking at options to see how do we diversify and look at different things. Awesome. Cool. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So who's Gerald? Where did you grow up? And where did you study your early parts of your career, like your mid up to metric? Uh, yeah. You're taking me back in the days. Um, so I grew up in Durban, uh, between two places. A uh, very early stage would be in a township called Umlazi, uh, a v, v section. For those who come from uh, Durban, Umlazi, they know the V section where we're saying, I say, Dole Bovo, then you know exactly. <laughs> where one comes from, we were one of those few uh, Mazakele houses where, as you know, traditionally back the, how the housing was in the townships. But as I grew up as a kid, it was already been built to what my parents uh, liked it to be. So that's where I grew up. I beginning schooled the Sandagashe uh, is the school I schooled in. Uh, which is uh, just, say, probably three kilometers from where I used to stay. Um, so that's where it's all begun. But then also while still at early stage, we moved as a family to a little bit further south, which is Emanzim Toti. So, so I'm known as a Toti boy because there was later in stages and I was grown up and in fact, my high school was mostly in uh, Medzim Toti, but not exactly in Toti. Next door to Toti, people who come from there will know um, Kingsway High School. So I went to Kingsway High School. And for this discussion, possibly I will assist or show some light to the people who I could say, I did different kind of schooling where yeah. um, I schooled in high school till about standard eight. Um, I don't know what it's called now. It shows my age, <laughs> <laughs> grade, whatever. So, yeah. um, then at standard eight, as I left, uh, I went to what you call um, trade schooling where you learn a trade. So the last two years of your high school were at a trade school in Durban Technical College. And then there I did technical drawing. Um, there's few things, of course, I learned there, which I think it did open my mind to where I am now to seeing things uh, differently. So I did Durban Technical College for two years and I completed that. Um, I don't know if you want me to stop there, but that's roughly where I come from in terms of schooling, in terms of where I grew up. Awesome. That sounds interesting. And I think maybe I'd like to pick your brain a little bit around because because when you start saying started eight, I'm like, sure, this is interesting. I don't remember when last people said that. <laughs> in fact, I remember my parents used to say from one, from two, and, and I was like, Ooh, what are you talking about? <laughs> yes, yes. yes. So, so tell us a little bit about that piece that you spoke about. So formal schooling, you finished at standard eight and then you got into uh, trade schooling between sort of for two years, which is what then would constitute your matriculation. Yes, actually also to probably explain that if there are students or people listening, there are those kids who schooling is different for them, yeah. who uh, schooling is not for them. Uh, for a while, I was one of those. In fact, I was bored 
and but you have to do it. But I think the older I grew till about standard eight, I sort of, at least you could negotiate with your parents. I knew I, I don't belong here. And, but also to those who are finding it difficult, it's not to say you are slow yeah. or you stupid or whatever you, it's just, you just different. So yeah. that's one thing I would agree to because looking where I am now, I've seen challenges, yes, but I can be part of uh, serious conversations now, but I had to build my career from nowhere because as what to some would perceive that, okay, with standard eight, you are just as good as nothing. But I argue that because at that technical schooling, by learning technical drawing, it opened another door of avenues for me. I was interested in what I was doing. I enjoyed it. Whether I'm in that field now or not, that's different. But I think to complete that um, matriculation, it helped. I did something that I enjoyed. And yes, as I said, to enlighten, at the beginning it was for as an escape code, you know, to say, hey, I've had it with schooling. But then if I rewind backwards today, Actually, I learned a lot. Actually, it was a good decision. And by doing it that way, you almost have to hustle your whole way in life. But if you are that kind of person, it's okay. So, because even today I hustle, but as the older you get, you choose your battles, you choose your hustles. So whatever the different hustles I had to learn from that transition, it has molded me to today. Yeah, sure. That is very insightful. And, and thank you very much for that. You touched on a very interesting point. Um, I remember back in the day, uh, I had a few cousins that uh, we used to laugh about it uh, as we grew up. But, you know, in, in our culture at the time, people would typically say in the communities, you are a slow learner. That's why they're taking you to the technical school and you're not good for this sort of mainstream education. Yes. And you're raising a valid point that it's not that uh, for a lot of people. It's actually for some of them, they're, they're naturally bored about this academic stuff. It's not things that work for their, their, their mental ability. And they do well in other aspects of their life. And in fact, they make uh, more profitable organizations than what we've seen as yes. well as they progress in life. And you, want, you almost wonder that should I have been laughing at those people or not at this time? Yeah, uh, but again, growing up young, we don't know what we're talking about. We keep teasing each other. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. So, so when you finished from the technical school, um, what happened uh, to you? Where did you go? Um, again, another change in how I did things. Most people will talk about varsity, talk about what have you. So with the technical skill that I had, I could already move into work if i could say that so it did open a door for me i remember back then in pine town there was a place for you know the printer will have an inside in terms of there's a lot of things that happens inside the printer there's your cartridges there's your toner cartridges there is the printer itself so the company as small as it was that i joined but there's a lot I gained from that company. So I was a technical person in the warehouse where I had to learn the inside of a printer. So even today, a lot of companies sell printers and whatever you, and as we go later in my career, you'll understand I even worked for a printer organization, but we'll get to that. But what I'm trying to say, no one can sell or falsely sell a printer to me, I know the intricacies. I know what's in the printer. I know if you're talking speed, then it should equate to this. The price should go to. So that's for me, that's a trade I learned, which it's a trade that even if things change to technology, but it's something that I take with to my career because I still think that beginning has shaped me to today. Uh, because what I did in that technical space, 
I was an ink cartridge technician, then moved to the printer cartridge technician, then moved to a printer technician. So in the span of, say, three years, with this or four years into this growth of different things, I even then moved to sales within that small company of sales of these ink cartridges, toner cartridges, as what is known that it's not good to refill a cartridge or to refill toner, but if you are of a technical background and you understand all the things, the drums that are in the cartridge, you're much more allowed to do the refilling because you understand the technical of the printer, you understand the technical of the, uh, the printer, toner, or the inkjet. So you know which one has life or this one is no longer life. We knew we had testers that an ink cartridge I can refill up to about three times, a toner cartridge I can refill up to about five times. So coming from that technical workshop, we knew these things. Hence, I could challenge even today people who will say, you can't refill an ink cartridge or a toner cartridge. You can't refill if it's just you're buying those ink things just to you do it yourself. Yes, then I agree. But if it's from a technical workshop where we have invested to different equipment or machinery, we didn't have to touch these things with our hands. These things, you put it in, it opens, it does it itself. There were things talking to each other. So it was a proper workshop. So in that, I support. And then if I don't know if you want to take a break or should I just carry on on what happened then to next to next? Yeah, I think you can carry on. I was just going to add one inset that I, I remember the injection one. I had a small inject printer. I learned the very hard way that you can't inject into a cartridge. It messes things up for you. Yes. But please continue and just take us through your career journey in terms of how it progressed and, and, and how you reached the point you're in now. Okay, then um, in that role, we had few clients that were in the <coughs> printer business, like your Ryko, Nashua, Canon, um, HP, you name it. Yeah. Now, the bulk of these companies behind the scenes were refilling wow. their cartridges and then off-selling to clients, but it was done proper, as mm -hmm. I said. Mm -hmm. The way we did the workshop it made it proper, so there was nothing wrong. Hence, they could off-sell these, so they were approved as according to them. So then we we had a lot of clients in that regard. Then I got very close to Nashua, and um, wherever we bump to each other, or we have a client that is refilling cartridges, mm -hmm. but is refilling cartridges that belong to machines that belong to Nashua. Yeah. So sometimes Nashua is here, yeah, probably dropping off paper, and then we there dropping off cartridges. Then we would talk and argue as you know, salespeople, hey, you're not allowed to refill for our machines. Ah, it's out of service contract, it's out of maintenance. The client wants mm -hmm. half the price than original, then we would laugh it off. But then as that happened, I think I engaged more and more knowing different salespeople into these different companies. Yeah. And then one of a close friend, uh, a lady saw how passionate I was, said, hey, why don't you join us at Nashville? I said, yo, I never thought about that, but it makes sense because I know the inside of a printer. Yeah. Doesn't matter what printer. So if it's a Nashville printer or Canon printer or whatever, I can talk to it. So that was a smooth transition. It makes sense. If she could make it happen, why not? And then there I was. Yeah. Uh, appointment was set for interview and then uh, there I was being interviewed I was offered a job from first time conversation um, and then from that first wow. conversation it just gelled from one thing to another so from there we grew and I joined the team uh, you want me to carry on okay yeah please do I joined the sales team um, I reached my targets monthly, I excelled, 
that was probably a good three years. It was Nashua Durban I worked for uh, before they moved to new offices now. Uh, three, three and a half years, I think. Then I was promoted to Joburg. Uh, I did want to go to Joburg. I had a family in Joburg. And why not? Everyone wants to go to Joburg. So there I went to Joburg still with Nashua. I moved to Nashua North. Same thing there. Now the role has changed. At the beginning at Nashua, you start by knocking on doors. Then from knocking on doors, you have your base that you look after. So I did all of that in Nashua Durban into my growth. Then when I moved to Nashua North in Johannesburg, I had a bigger scope, key account manager, where it's big corporates now, where you look at their fleet. You've had these machines for three years. In the following three years, you need to upgrade to these. So there were a lot of things in between to maintain the clientele. So from there, I grew to a bigger role in terms of the clientele you look after. Now you have the MTNs, now you have the yeah. Vodacons, now you have uh, Bitverse, you name it, okay? So now I'm exposed mm -hmm. to a bigger group. So my early career, everything seems to fall to the next job without me looking for it. It happened while at Nashua. Yeah. The, one of the prominent clients we had was MTN. And then same thing, MTN, I was approached. Hey, you're so good in what you do, passionate in what you do. Why don't you jump ship and join us? And there was a bit of a challenge in the sense of now nah, MTN, whoa, it's mobile, it's connectivity. This is something I haven't done. So I was a bit worried uh, about that one, but I still joined. And then again, interviews were done, three sets of interviews, and uh, it succeeded to a job. Um, are you still with me? I'm still with you. I just want to check something there at that point. So in Nashua, you did a lot of sales when you moved into that space and grew into key account manager role. And then in MTN, are you still in the sales space or did you change gear to something else? Okay, MTN, as I said, it was a different transition. It's mobile, it's connectivity. It's, it was a new world for me. And yeah. um, I took the role to learn, but the role that I was up front was still sales. But now I had to uh, start, I had to start in, from the beginning again now, because it's a new role. So I was now selling from new clients that I have to source out, okay? okay. I, I did not have a base, but within three months, I was proving to be doing what is supposed to be done in moving uh, more and connectivity, I got very passionate about. So I did a lot of which we call it ISP, Internet Service Provider. So MTN okay. those days was like a third tier ISP. When I say third tier ISP is you had your Sykes, which is Telcom. You had uh, uh, UUNet was one of them back in the days, which UUNet is part of MTN. Now there was a time where UUNet was Verizon, then into MTN business. But people who are in the ISP, they will know that, okay, this guy is quite seriously old to talk of, to talk of your Verizon. Uh, so there were a few ISPs there to a tier ones, and then most, like your MTNs those days, but to, today MTN is not a third tier or second tier, they are a first tier ISP now. But back in the days when it started off, they were second, third tier, so we would get chunk of bandwidth from your tier one companies. So that was the transition I was in, in that stage. So I sold quite a lot of these ISP services. I, I was very passionate about it because now I'm selling communication. Still for me, yeah. it was still a channel of way it started off from refilling cartridges to printer, yeah. printer yeah. sales to communication now. It's still for me yeah. one thing, you know, now I'm talking communication, where I'm putting communication into different floors of a company. Now I have a corporate company that has five floors, 10 floors, you know, so communication became very serious and 
that's where I saw different things. I saw hosting, I saw connectivity, I saw mobile. Now I'm exposed to this world of communication. Into can communication happen in 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 so many different ways? So I was fascinated. I was excited. It was definitely a new world for me. Then, but that world has paved where I am today Before. for what I do today. Yeah. Before before you continue from that point, I mean, I, I want to pick up on something interesting. You you speaking extremely technically um, about your journey as well, which is fantastic. Now I'm curious to know how did you get? How did you teach yourself all of that information? Because I'm hearing a lot of you are able to immerse yourself in all these different environments, understand how it works, be good at it, be identified as that good person, progress into the next thing. So how did you learn in these new environments, those technical uh, information that you have, what an ISP is, what communication is, and all of that? Okay, I was lucky in a sense, I think the adoption I took is imperative to everyone who wants to grow. Don't travel alone in terms of your trajectory. So at Nashua, I was lucky enough, uh, I got my cousin a job at Nashua. So okay. he was my person, you could say. So being my person, uh, there's a lot of technical things I challenged him on because he was employed as a technician. So mm -hmm. although I was in sales, but there's a lot I was learning because we even stayed together because he came from Pumalanga and we were in Durban. So he resided with us at home. So he was like, he's my brother. So yeah. a lot of this I would get from him. So, okay, yes, I'm selling, but it does this, then it does this. No, the problem is this. You need to think this is what's the problem. But when a printer does that or... Um, so, because we used to sell multifunctional printers where it's a printer, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a scanner. No, the problem is the scanner. It's not doing this. The problem is the printer. It's not. Do so there's a lot I learned and I allowed myself to have friends in sales, have friends in technical and lucky as my brother, we were mingling in the same circle. So there's a lot I learned. Yeah. There. And then if you move to MTN, same thing, MTN, I mingled with the technical department. I mingled with the sales department. I mingled with the finance. I was never a person that only does what I'm employed to do only. I invested in knowing different departments in all companies I've worked for. From the sweeper to the top, they will tell you who Gerald is. So in doing that, wow. there's different skills you learn because remembering as you said earlier, we come from old tradition of believing that ah, if you haven't done schooling metric, something slow with you. So all my life I knew I always have to be a step ahead. So being a step ahead, I had to invest in growing my knowledge. So the only way I knew yeah. for me was to ask questions, was to mingle with the people I can learn from. So that has worked for me. But to answer that again, it's a right way, even if you did your metric or whatever, you went to varsity or whatever, yeah. I would still advise, mingle with the people that do different things to what you employed to do. There's a lot you learn from how they do things. There's a lot you learn from different uh, circles because you don't know what tomorrow your job will be. It might need the knowledge yeah that you could have learned from someone next door to you. So I use that very well in asking people and always knowing I've shortchanged myself. But looking back now, I, I, I never shortchanged myself. It was just no, growing. It, yeah. it was just growing. So that's how I can talk technical. You talk business, I can talk. You talk technical, I can talk. <laughs> you need to put it together if it comes now with the skill of hands putting it together, no, that I don't know. But I can talk right <laughs> now. You need to do this and this, this, why? Why is your bandwidth slow? Bandwidth is slow because one, two, three, you need to increase your bandwidth. Like what we're doing now, 
to make it a success, we, you and me know, we need to think what bandwidth are we using? Is it Wi-Fi? Yes. How strong is the Wi-Fi? All those things, but I can talk about it technically because I understand exactly I wanted to know. Sure, I'm tempted to probe you further on what we can do to improve our bandwidth, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> but, yeah. so, so now your career is in MTN. Uh, you sound like you're growing naturally in all the careers that, that, that you've kind of pursued. Um, what happened after MTN? Um, now I have to think, okay, MTN, as I was exposed now to this communication world, I again asked myself, what makes all this possible? Then it was a matter of upskilling oneself. Then I asked myself, how do the organizations or individuals upskill themselves? Then it was about training. So one of the clients, again, I looked after at MTN, was IT Intellect College. IT Intellect College was in training of A pluses and pluses, MCSE and all that. So I knew one of the executives there. Then he approached me to join his team. Then it was a transition for me, but now, okay, I'll be at the place where you're selling all these courses. So now I understand what is involved in A plus, what is involved in N plus, what is involved in MCSE. You go on and go on. Security, security plus, what are those things? C plus plus, what are those things? So now I was selling the courses to corporates, the same corporate I was looking at at MTN. So sales of, of solutions of corporate uh, training was booming those days because everyone in, that, in our era, we realized that IT is the way, ICT is the way. So most people, yeah corporates were investing into these trainings. So that went well, I enjoyed it. Um, that was a change again of changing my career, but to learn something else now in terms of training and in terms of, of these courses. So that's how I left MTN to transition into training. And that opened many doors in, 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 into training. Sure. I mean, it, it sounds interesting because, I mean, I'm hearing you are, are faced with an opportunity to explore different opportunities. I mean, how do you how do you zone in into one that you say this this is the one that I think will work for me in terms of my next career move? Because um, I'm, I'm imagining you could have had a number of executives asking you to work with them uh, because of what you're being able to do in sales. So how would you then decide I'm going to go the training route? Um, and not many other options that are that are available to me. Um, I'm a risk taker, so <laughs> I don't have to feel comfortable to do certain things. Take a risk. Okay. If it doesn't work, move to something else. Of which probably sometimes there were mistakes or mishaps happened, but uh, Bill Gates uh, usually says there's nothing wrong in falling but fall and dust yourself quick and move on. So taking yeah. a risk, you believe in that, that you will fall, but it's about what you do once you've fallen. So in taking a risk, that's why you find different or diverse organizations, because again, from that training college courses, I went back, so we chose, it was probably a mistake for me, but I survived in that for two years. I got bored. Okay. I went back to communication. I went, now I went to MWeb, MWeb uh, communication. MWeb is known for being the ISP to sell your uncapped ADSL, to sell ADSL, to sell internet connectivity in terms of the bandwidth itself. So I went back now to MWeb. So again, I think when I was with MTN doing the communication, doing a bit of ISP, I enjoyed it. Then I transitioned yeah. to training. I still enjoyed that, but I think I enjoyed the ISP side more. Hence, I went to MWeb. Yeah. So if going to IT Intellect was like a break or I'll say something different, 
I was lucky that it happened like a transition, but to some it doesn't. So I moved yeah. back to MWeb, and MWeb I enjoyed. I excelled in what I did. There were challenges as it's a sales environment. Now we became a bigger group. Some are selling more than others. And, but I survived yeah. all the battles. I was with MWeb business for about three to four years. Um, I grew again there in Johannesburg, and of which today the MWeb is part of the Internet Solution Group, which is part of the Dimension Data Group. But to mention the interesting of that story at MWeb, um, I left MWeb after three, four years, as I say. And where did I go? I went to Dimension Data. Now, Dimension, <laughs> Data, Dimension Data is a conglomerate, even today, of everything. Yeah. So it's you find different businesses there. You have your networking, you have your security, you name it. You have your internet solutions, which is a it was a subdivision, but still in the umbrella of Dimension Data. Today it's one story. There's one Dimension Data. So I was yeah. in a Dimension Data. You have those who will say the old boys. So I'm of the old boys yeah. group. You know where you Andy Lengaba was the chairman of EMEA. And that generation of Andy Lengaba, when he was there, I was in that transition. And trans, uh, Andy Le had come from government at that time. And then he moved to Dimension Data to be the chairman for EMEA. That's the generation I was with. So that generation was very passionate about government, about public sector. Public sector is still a challenge today, but we understood it. There's a lot we learned even relationships we still have today in different spheres in government, but you had to understand how to engage with government back then, which makes one still be able to tap into different people even today, but you just have to have a product that talks to government. So another thing as I grow myself, which hits me is I ended up networking with a lot of serious people, a lot of important sure. people. But now comes another challenge. You have these people around you, but you don't know what you can offer or what yeah. they can offer you. And that's the difficult challenge to have for, for anyone, to know these serious yeah. people. But it, they don't know what, how to help you, what to give you, what to, because now you are, because I always engage with everyone. So I was known yeah. to be the person who's, who knows everyone, who knows everything. Now, if an important person is thinking of me, is thinking, no, you sort it. The other one is thinking the same yeah. thing. So sometimes you end up not having anything because everyone thinks you. <laughs> so re-evaluate, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I had to learn that. You you have to know your channel, where you are aiming, what you need to change. So there was a time where everything, I could say, fell through, but you make it work. You know, there's a lot I've learned which you do self-look. Um, and where am I going? Am I still going to where I want to? Where do I come from? For now, it's a beautiful story, but there was times where things had to go down a bit, but you lift yourself yeah. because the relationships are valuable or you make them yeah. valuable and you make them serious. Let me give you time there to say something, then I'll carry on. Yes, I actually wanted to dip into the idea of, um, so it sounds like a nice growth tra trajectory. I mean, for, for a lot of people listening to you now saying you've got very influential people that you know, you've got nothing necessarily to offer them as yet. It's a good problem to have because <laughs> you can almost make uh, a connection and figure out something to help them with the problem they have or whatever. Um, but what type of challenges did you come across in your career that that is, that is, um that has helped you along the way and how did you deal with them? And, and another thing I want you to also just reflect on a little bit is around the issue of corporates always look at your CV and say, but wait, your credentials don't have this university or how did you, how did you overcome that hurdle in the, in, in the interview processes that you had gone through? If it was a hurdle at all. Um, that for me was never a challenge because remember in most of my career changes, I had proven myself 
before joining those organizations. They found an yeah. interest, then they want me. So when that opportunity comes, you open up, you want me, but this is how I work. Yeah. This is who I am. Yeah. And I can do the job. I have history that talks for me. There's things I've done that yeah. talk for me. I have clients that will vouch what I'm saying. But if you are someone who's looking for papers and whatever, then I'm not your guy. But I was strong at what I do and how I do it and be straight. So organizations love someone like that who believes in themselves and True. believe in your skill and believe in your turf. This is how you do it. This is what drives you. Because every time if it's a job opportunity, I will tell them what drives me. What drives me is to make the number for the company, what I've been yeah. asked to do, and to exceed that. And at the same time, I want to be exposed out there for more people to know who I am and how I do things more than who the company is. In all instances, yeah. it's about me. Hence, the relationships I have today, even on LinkedIn, um, I've exceeded 25,000 connections. There's a reason for that. Sure. Yes, I won't know all of them in one day, but sometime people I need, in fact, most cases are in that. So engaging on LinkedIn is not easy. People will accept, 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 but it's about what influence you have in them, what messages yeah. you share, what do you post, and what do you question when they post. That's a skill, again, I've learned. Beside your varsities and whatever, you won't learn that in the university. You have to yeah. learn in your own way. So I challenge these posters that the serious people put. I ask questions. Even with this COVID, they are now we do webinars. There'll be online webinars. I'll be the one who has most questions on those webinars. I make sure. I know the webinar will have a CEO of this, a CEO of that. If he doesn't know me, he will know about me. If it's an opposite uh, yeah. organization, I will research so much of that organization that I will sort of, not to make it look bad, but just to show, I've researched about you. You are one, two, three. Yeah. You do this. But are you aware of one, two, three? So by that interchange of words, someone tomorrow when I knock on their door via LinkedIn, while it's still fresh in their mind, Oh, you the guy yesterday. Oh, you that guy yesterday. Then it opens doors for new opportunities. So that's how my team has grown. Even during this pandemic, it has grown so much because everything is about webinars. But those webinars, I'm not just watching, I participate. And yeah. that has also opened doors for something else which I'm passionate about, uh, women initiative organizations, about mentoring women yeah. to do better. And I'm part of a group which uh, is called Women Initiative or D in Digital Series. And these women, the people who lead there, it's very prominent women who are doing amazing work. So being in the same circle as them has also opened up other doors. Every second week, we interview a very influential piece of person, very influential women. These women run organizations. So while we do these online webinars, I'll be the guy who does the questions. So the public will put the questions into the Zoom sessions or team sessions. Then I have to choose the questions that fit the caliber that we're interviewing. Then I have to ask those questions. So when it comes to conversations of tomorrow, next month, these leaders know who I am because I was the one doing the transition of questions during their sessions. So you see, I always look for something to get out. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I actually love that analogy. Uh, you've spoken about network at another level. I mean, often we say, go build coffee sessions, go meet new people, find out what they do. You've, you've actually given us a good understanding of how to even do it virtually through platforms like LinkedIn and how to make sure that it, it helps you uh, by putting yourself out there and putting what you love, what you, what you do um, out there as well. So tell us a little bit about, um, from, from your perspective at Sterod, what are some, you've spoken about the women initiative that you're passionate about. 
what are other things that are, are passion are passionate for you considering where you come from uh considering how schooling was for you and the experiences you've had for you uh in case it so what are some of the things that you are quite excited about that makes you uh want to go back and make a big impact in in case if you're not back in case no uh, i think case i can be part and parcel of it in a sense of offering solutions and, okay. um, but not physically to go back because really there's huge that is happening within the Johannesburg, you know, everything is around Joburg. Cape Town is yeah. different and the organization I'm with now, we do a lot of traveling so I can reach Durban, I can reach Cape Town. We even do Africa business, we do international business. So. There are people who can sit and talk of that nature that come from your varsities. But I can also talk yeah. about it now, but it wasn't easy. Uh, even now, I, I have still not reached my goal. There was a time where I just wanted to be the middleman because everyone needs something from someone. Yeah. yeah. So with the people I have in my network, I can connect all these dots, connect all these people. So yeah. that's my future. I've not reached that. But in the smallest of its form, I can tap into different people for different solutions. Like as we're speaking now, there's an organization I'll be selling a different solution to in Kenya. I know that organization through someone I met in another webinar, and that person is a chair lady of this Vodacom of Kenya, Adrian Kenya. So that's what I'm saying, always be with the right people. If you don't know these people and you're in webinars with them, challenge them. And the way I gained friendship with this lady who's of this big organization, during a webinar, I challenged them. I said, you people are good in these webinars, but behind the scenes, then you do nothing in supporting the smaller guy, you always say the smaller guy can become bigger, bigger, bigger. I said, well, I'm not a smaller guy in the sense of I'm the organization, but I'm talking for myself. I'm with an organization that talks cybersecurity. I'm passionate about cybersecurity. It's so imperative right now, cybersecurity. So I'm talking for me. How do I reach you to make sense to you? Then they said the same thing that I believe. It's about being in webinars that they are in. And they make it a good example, like you are in this webinar now, and you are part and parcel of it. You are mentioning things, you are asking, you're contributing. Then do you think tomorrow I won't remember who Gerald is? He says, yeah. I will remember. So I said, actually, I'll put you to the challenge. So tomorrow <laughs> I'll be emailing you. I will be saying, sending my request on LinkedIn. says, okay, I'm waiting. And it happened. Today, I can talk to her anytime. She's opening doors, and as a business, we into Africa, we into Zambia, Malawi, you name it, and now she's open door in Kenya. So yeah. that's why I say always be around people who can make an influence or a difference to what you're doing. Some of them yeah. won't open the door immediately, but be yeah. the irritation. There's another lady we went to see at DBSA probably three months uh, before lockdown, six months back. And I went with my CEO and she said, yo, Gerald, you can piss someone. You can be in <laughs> And she only said that after the presentation we did to say, wow, is this what you guys do as an organization? No wonder you've been in trouble and in irritation. And then she also said it to my CEO that, no, this guy can test. So, but it was for good reason. So, not yeah. every door will open same time. And if I can tell you a few places where we close to now, but if I can tell you how long it took, some of them takes a year, knocking yeah. and knocking. Try different people at the organization. Then when you come through someone else, then the person says, "Yo, is it you? You find your way through the back." Yes, again. <laughs> Those are the things I decided to learn for me and they help me. I'm, I have not reached my goal, but I'm going there. I will get there. But it's about accepting 
it will be difficult because but now the network that I say I have, I can see it working for me now. I can see doors being open. Maybe I'm just understanding that now. Probably this is the, my time now because I'm with the organization or besides the organization, let me talk the passion I have for what I'm doing in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, Cybercrime is rampant. There's a lot yeah. of companies that we, back in the days, you would, you, you would hear of uh, companies being breached or hacked yeah. be in the yes. or in the movies. Now it's closer home. I can think of life health care recently. They were breached. You can think yeah. of liberty. They were breached in some instance in the last year or two. The yeah. experience, experience just less than three months. Yeah. The breach, uh, people's ideas were exposed. All those things are exciting me. So where I am now, it's a different career. This is now, I've realized this is my end impression. So this is where I need to hit hard, need hit most, because the age is also another thing. But I, being the one enjoying <laughs> what I'm doing now, I know I can make a concluding to where I'm going with it, because everything when you look from today you're thinking for ir you're thinking um everything is advanced uh, communication for ir cyber security um it's about robotics this is the future it's not going to change to something yeah. else so from now on till the end this is how we're going to talk it's just how it maneuvers yeah. or how it changes but this is the conversation forever so I'm really excited about it because it's about organizations and you can never have 100% cyber security in your organization, but you can do something to minimize the risk. It's about doing those pen testing in your organization and pen testing is about checking how vulnerable you are as an organization. You're doing your vulnerability assessments. Now I'm talking again, technical, but it's a good technical where in your organizations, do you have a SOC, Security Operations Center, where a SOC needs to look after your organization 24-7, 365. Your pen test and vulnerability assessments you can do probably every three months. If you are a SOC client with an organization like us, you are looked after every second. And then these pen testing vulnerability assessments happen automatically because you're part of a bigger picture of a song. So there's so much. We do advisory services. I'm passionate about advisory. It's about talking. It's about networking with clients. It's about where do you want to go? Your CRO, chief risk officers, love us. Because if an organization goes wrong, who's in trouble? It's a CRO. You are a risk officer. Yes, it has those clients to your CEOs, your CIO. But as a risk you need to look at all risk of the business. So as you could hear, when I talk about it, I'm quite chuffed about it. I'm quite passionate yeah. about it. So where I am now, I think I have found myself because wow. it's really exciting when I have this conversation. Even the people I referenced to earlier on, Andy Lengava, he's a conglomerate of 4IR communication, of technology communication, call it that technology per se, is you can go to him for anything within technology. So when he talks, I understand. When he explains things, I understand. So staying close to people that drive you, there's different organizations that I could name, your Sastres of the world, your yeah. TNs. We've partnered with these organizations, but not only partners as a business, even individually for myself, like Sastres. I'm close to a CIO there. I'm close to the finance director. There's different things I'm learning there. Even if having coffee, in those coffee sessions, there's a lot you learn. So with this interest, I've also individually studied mentoring. I mentor those who want to aspire, those who want to do better. So hence, I supported your interview because you also have a mentoring. But probably you've chosen to mentor students. I mentor, I mentor my people who are similar to me in a sense of their career. They, they, they've just about reached it. They don't know how to prioritize their time. They don't know how to grow 
themselves in terms of individually they've done everything well but it's not it's all cluttered it's they want to grow those engagements with the sea level how do you do that how do you reach how do you do it through linkedin how do you do it through webinars how do you sell yourself there and when you talk people listen so that's what i do now i'm mentoring people to be better to be able to carry themselves you are here today next month yeah. be there. six months time be there always have a view have a goal so that's what i do that i'm passionate about but it's still around cyber security or personal yeah. development yeah fantastic I'm, I'm loving your story so much because there's a lot that you've shared with us um, to not think stuff conventionally and you've also challenged our thinking in terms of how do we go out and, and chase after the passions that we have. I mean, if I think of the conversation of the LinkedIn and, and how you say you're pestering, I'm like, I can learn a thing or two from you. <laughs> so that I've taken on, my, on myself to say the networks that you have, how do you use them? Um, and, and, and leverage what LinkedIn is about, is to creating those networks and, and making sure that you guys help each other where you can and, and leverage each other where, where it's possible. So, so I'm loving hearing that as well, and I'm thinking it's a useful tool um, for everyone out there. And so, so I think to probably help you to understand even better that LinkedIn story, even the organization I'm with now, my first entry deal uh, I was not on, uh, what do you call it, basic salary. I had to yeah. prove myself. So I had to bring something to prove that I'm worth it. So again, taking risk. I had no income due to the sufferings I had. So it was a transition that I was not employed in any way. So I said, ah, let me give it a try. So I sold over a million rent business into our money, it was in dollars, out of relationship from LinkedIn. I spoke to the chair lady of the bank on LinkedIn, took me three weeks. And in these three weeks, she first put me in contact with the CEO of the bank. CEO was on holiday, I couldn't find the CEO. I went back to her. You put me through this guy, but I can't find this guy. Then put me through another HR director. HR director, we spoke two occasions, and because the call came from the chair lady, so the HR director had to listen. So she also yeah. said, hey, this is not my thing. You're talking technical. You need to talk to a CRO, and CRO is this person. So I was transferred to someone else now. Now, the CRO even tells me today that he's not a guy to accept any calls because a bank is in proper things long before we can think of. But because the call came from higher, it's a call via the chair lady. So he had to listen. So again, the power of knowing the right people. Then yes. when I spoke to him, hey, I'm one, two, three, this is what I'm doing. I was saying, hitting the buttons at the right places. As much as yes, he wasn't willing to talk. But he says, this guy knows what he's talking about. You're talking yeah. about a sock. You're talking about doing pen testing. You're talking about uh, cyber crime. You, I was talking things that touch him. So that's another thing. When you have a solution, you must know how it's going to impact the person you're talking to or the person you'll be yeah. talking to. So I had to touch on his point. On I had to research how many ATMs the bank has. How do they operate? Is everything run from the head office? And I looked at the gaps. So when we engage, then he says, hey, I like what you're talking. Let's arrange a call. Since it was from Zambia, we had now to arrange a call via your online. It was Skype before COVID. So we use Skype. It was myself, then a CEO. Then as we're talking, he says, hey, actually, I'm coming for a run in South Africa in about two weeks. Why don't we talk then? We arranged, yeah. when he was in South Africa for a run, now we can talk in an office. So in a ballroom, yeah. we stood in that ballroom in there for like four hours, five hours. Then we went to sure. dinner. Afterwards. That dinner was a ceiling thing. That's where we concluded the deal. And two weeks later, we got an order, more than a million rand of business. Wow. wow. And all from LinkedIn. And okay. even the one that we're talking about now of Kenya, I've never met these people. It's through LinkedIn. Now, with yeah. the, the respect to COVID, 
everything is run now on Zoom, on Teams, on uh, Google Meet. It's the day of the business, but it even makes things quicker now. So okay. this is how engagements we are doing. That's what is working today. So always move with time. Don't stay behind. If time requires to talk in online, do that. If time requires to do your tweets and whatever, do that. So move with time. Awesome. Look, I'm loving what you've said, and thank you so much for it. Uh, thank you so much for your time as well. Um, I will definitely reach out to you because what, what something else we've been doing is building master classes to start helping professionals build these skill sets you're talking about. Is how do you use your LinkedIn network to benefit you? How do you get a sale out of LinkedIn <laughs> that can take you forward. And I, and I think it's, we take for granted how much knowledge is available within the community or the network that we even have in LinkedIn. So those master classes are targeted at that specifically. Like you said earlier, it's in those webinars that you build the relationships, that you get known, that people want to hear from you and, and want to do stuff with you. Yes. Um, so we want to create that space as well that allows people to be able to do that, which will be fantastic. Sure. Any final thoughts, uh, things that you'd like to leave behind for us to think about? I think you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I understand cybersecurity a little bit better now <laughs> from what you've explained. And, and I could hear from your passion, there's constructs I didn't even know about that I now know about, like SOC. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm quite curious to hear from you what would be your, your parting words. I think we've touched on a lot, but as a passing message which could benefit everyone, if there's even organizations listening here, there's people who run companies listening here, invest in your employees invest in educating your employees and even where i am now we have uh, what we call cyber security awareness training the times we're living they are about awareness if you understand the full communication of cyber security the weakest link in any organization more than 90 percent of the time is the human element is individual you have employed. Companies are so good at when there's a breach, things have gone wrong, they will look who's involved, who did what, who did what, who opened that email. But have you trained your employees on awareness of such things that come from the World Wide Web? Some of these uh, employees don't know these things, but and when you run an awareness training, don't do the mistake of HR compiling their researches and putting it together and doing online tests. HR is not experts. HR is there for monitoring the organization to improve. So work with the specialist organizations to package an awareness training for your organization. And that awareness training should have social engineering, where social engineering is about how people could be lured to think differently like the cyber hackers. So you don't answer this, you don't do that, you see something like this, but now more in reality because it comes from a cybersecurity specialist organization who sees these ransomwares, who sees these DDoS attacks, who sees malware, all those things that you as an organization or as an HR fraternity, you will not drill down to. Spend money yeah. organization to upskill your people you will do well as an organization to look after yourselves. And some security used to be, uh, the spend of cyber security used to be uh, done not willingly, but things have changed. Yeah. Cyber security, security, it should be done up front. It's part and parcel of a conversation. Organization wants to do well, include cyber security a specialist, then you will do well. Yeah. So my parting message is please let's uh, educate and educate and educate and opportunities are opening in cyber security there's so many things one can do yeah. there are pen testers there's your ceh uh, uh, security i mean a certified ethical hacker those yeah. things are going hot if there are students listening ceh pen testers uh, security um uh, courses there are plenty there's a lot one can specialize in within security courses or security job offers that are out there 
So probably I'm more about educating, I'm more about upskilling and being in the right sectors. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much for those words. I really appreciate it. Um, and, and thank you so much for your time as well. I think it's it's really, really valuable what you've shared with us. Um, and we will definitely take the wisdom and use it to help the students as well. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.